All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. The stuff that dreams are made of. The horror. The horror. Imagine performing in a motion picture and you get to deliver the last line, and that line was written by Billy Wilder, Robert Town, John Huston, or Francis Ford Coppola. What about David Mamet? Mamet made a movie for HBO called Phil Spector about the famous music producer. The film has Al Pacino as Spectre and Helen Mirren plays his lawyer. As it wraps up, the last line of the film wasn't in Pacino's or Mirren's mouth. It wasn't in Gloria Swanson's, Humphrey Bogart's, or Marlon Brando's either. It was in veteran stage and screen actor John Piricello's, and he's here to talk about that, his volunteer work with children that have special needs, and anything in between on this episode of Five Dollar Buzz. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a bright new sunny episode of Five Dollar Buzz. Today, uh, we've got, as uh, per usual, uh, our man with the plan, Mr. George Kursar, out in Connecticut. How are you doing today, George? I'm doing good. If you could tell, uh, the weather's very temperamental here. Uh, had to bundle up a little bit today, and uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to our boy Pete, who's on assignment. He won't be here today. He will be missed. And uh, yeah, looking forward to another great episode, another really good conversation. In fact, we could even say he's prepping to do uh, the big show on Sunday. The uh, right. work, work in the Oscars this weekend as a stage manager. And then we also have our good friend, Nate Garden, our, you know, the, uh, downtrodden beaten suffering artist for the five dollar buzz buzz Unco- uncompensated artist uncompensated artist how's it going down in orange county oh it's wonderful john or uh, i'm so excited to see john i'm calling you john good times down here roger i i be like a little warm today though yeah it is a little warm and it's a little warm where i'm sitting right now so i might start sweating my ass off who knows ladies and gentlemen today we are very excited to have a veteran actor uh, man about uh, both in uh, stage and screen and television mr uh, john piricello am i saying that right or was it piricello that's both of those you know, e- either one all right yeah, yeah. all right and you know he got his um, start would it be fair to say that uh, the first thing that really got you noticed was it that harrison texas was that the thing that kind of got you uh we started to work more regularly. This uh, play by Horton Foot, you know, the man who did uh, to um, won the Pulitzer Prize for the young man from Atlanta to kill a mockingbird, tender mercies, Oscars, that he won. Was that something that uh, Horton Foot came to actually see your screen, uh, the the play, and Mr. David Mamet, right? Yeah, all of that is true. So, next question. he's a storyteller roger so you might have noticed uh that he was recently in godzilla versus kong which was the big movie out a couple years ago sat here in the big screen of my house and you did a brad payton movie too incarnate Mm. actually uh know of brad payton a little bit he did the rampage movie with uh the rock and uh big uh you know video game movie Mm -hmm. uh horror film and you worked with uh, Mamet and his daughter too, Clara Mamet. She's uh, directed you in a couple of things. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you were born in San Antonio, Texas. Is this going to be like just a test? Like, like the whole. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like I'm just throwing it. I'm just throwing it out there. So people not know who true, you are. True. Not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you a question. You say true or not true. Just okay. giving a brief introduction here, John. Oh, okay. All right. And then uh, one of the coolest things. I didn't get stuff, the syllabus, so I don't know. But, uh, we, we, we make it up as we go, John. Oh, good. Yeah, right. we good. just fly by the seat of our fucking pants. You've worked with me, John. You know how I operate. Come on. That's right. That's true. I, well, I think one of the more strangest things I read about you is that uh, both of your grandfathers and your own father are all named Joseph, and they were all pilots in the Air Force. Fighter is that pilots. right? That's right. They're fighter all, pilots. All combat fighter pilots. That's right. Wow. Yeah. They're, uh, yeah, and it's funny. I'm, um, reconnecting right now with uh i mean i, I have 
a lot of connections to a lot of a lot of my family spread out across the country. But uh, right now, um, I'm sort of reconnecting with some of the people that I haven't talked to in a while. I don't I don't have any social media at all, so it's hard for me to what well, not hard. I just don't end up connecting like all the social media people do. That's the, Is that you know, attending your relationships on an hourly basis on social media, John? Yeah, you know it's funny. I, it, yeah, it was it was a. Um, it was a tough call, right? It was sort of like all of this kind of good stuff where you get to sort of stay connected with people that you don't see a lot. Like all of that stuff is lovely and you see baby pictures and you see all these wonderful things, but then there's all that other crap. And it just kind of, that, it, that, that the play by play where someone takes a picture of every fucking meal and puts it on there. <laughs> if, if only, if only that's all it was, but it, all the sort of vitriol and the, and the, you know, boohoo poor me anyway, the point is, is that uh, I, I, I wasn't, I don't have the, constitution for it i'm, I'm uh my my bandwidth was, not, was not handle. Can't, can't, you can't curate a social media page I, I, it's a full-time job uh, yeah that's what imdb's for john you don't need that i was saying that i got off the social media i think the final straw was um i had got i had this antique table that i had appraised and i put it on craigslist and uh and it kept getting flagged and taken down and i had never i, I I'll try to sell this table on there. And um, this is not like, well, this is like a, whatever, a $750 thing, right? It's not an enormous deal. And uh, I put it up again and it got flagged again and taken down again. And I was like, wow. And of course with Craigslist, you can't call Craig, right? <laughs> you know, Craig, yeah. He doesn't have a phone number. <laughs> and so, and he doesn't even have people standing by, you know, at the call center. Uh, <laughs> so, so you have to go to, you have to go to their, um, their chat page or whatever right and sort of say hey community of people who just sell things and buy things and shouldn't really have any issues with the world <laughs> hey normal people no and so so i the first, i got the immediately this wave of just vitriol came toward me like like oh who i saw that you're in the body of your your uh you, you said it was 700 in the, in the in the title it says 700 you know you're trying to rip us you know and of course i made a mistake or and i was like oh okay and it was just like three or four just people like oh you had it appraised huh well why don't you just burn it and collect the insurance you fucker <laughs> you know and, <laughs> and and i was like wow okay that's the final straw I, craigslist I, and i and i took myself off of off of twitter and instagram and facebook and and then uh craigslist and linkedin <laughs> every, every goddamn social every media platform Lyft and uber and you know <laughs> you're, you're like randy quaid now man jeez i'm, I'm telling you i'm trying i i've been taught i've been trying to call and talk to verizon and they don't want to talk to me about it about putting a uh i want to trade my iphone for a just a flip phone i want to have a flip phone and uh, and that's f freaking them out. They're they're just like, what do you, well, you can't do that because you have this other plan. I said, all right, well, let's just get rid of that plan, and I want the new plan. They're like, no, you'll have to add a line if you do that, and then you can't have a the, the same well, that kind of phone with the other. You know, they're just like, Ugh, what are you doing? Oh, they they make it so you have to buy their new fancy finger phones. Always, well, yeah, yeah, anyway. it's no it's no joke. Uh. Well, that's... So anyway, so so a, a, a cousin of mine, a distant cousin of mine, my great, um, so my grandfather's, my Sicilian grandfather's sister, and her cousin, they were double cousins, two husbands uh, married to two two sisters, and uh, or two brothers married two sisters, and all of a sudden her story, like my great uh, grandfather, I think I can, just, I'm allowed to sort of come out and say this now. I never sort of talked about it whatever before but he, he's like a bootlegger because like a lot of people think about italians and they think oh they're all criminals or whatever so i used to sort of focus on well my grandfather was a lawyer they're all fighter pilots you know we have a plastic surgeon yada yada but my great grandfather who came over from sicily was a bootlegger and uh and god bless him and that's how they had you know that's how we all get to be here and have a life um and uh Wait, where was he bootlegging in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. You Omaha, know, Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. Omaha, Lots of Nebraska. corn there. He's making vodka. <laughs> they were. Uh, so anyway, so his 
one of his daughters was involved, you know, his cousin, um, uh, Louise, they're both named Louise. That's the other funny thing. Uh, <laughs> so Louise, uh, Louise, the cousin, uh, was sort of molested by this dude, this local dude. And then it sort of seemed like maybe he was starting to go after my cousin who was underage. who was like 12 at that point or whatever. Jesus. And so um, long story short, she just fucking killed the guy and uh, <laughs> shot him, like shot him in the fucking street, you know, like, like shot him oh, in, in like, Nebraska, like, like Scarface. He like ran out into the street and she fucking popped him a few more times in the street. He, 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 he stumbled over and like died in my grandfather's uh, pool room, you know? And, uh, and, the point is that was always just kind of family lore and now they're making a goddamn movie about it and uh, uh <laughs> and I, it's just Are you in it? like my cousin was like hey did you see this it was like on deadline you know hey did you see this and i was like well fucking hey how about that so um well how long ago did the story take place well i mean the 20s i guess right uh, that'd, be, that'd be a prohibition ball set act yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it would be during the yeah, obviously they're bootlegging. Well, you they were bootlegging after they bootlegging dude. after, yeah. Untouchables. David Mamet wrote a movie. He sure about did, yeah. It. He sure yeah. did, directed by Brian De Palma. Yeah. Um great movie. I'm also yeah. thinking of uh years. I'm also thinking of uh Buscemi down there in Atlantic City because he had guys coming as far as Cincinnati. Uh to transact Boardwalk. with them. So Boardwalk. I don't Boardwalk see, Empire. Yeah, on Boardwalk Empire and uh you know, I'm sure he had some tentacles out in uh, Omaha. So there could have been some uh, overlap there. Yeah, so is this why you're, you're avoiding social media because of stories like this, John? Or, absolutely or? not. I, I was oh. actually talking about my cousin about, I was talking about how, like, how really, really proud I am of my heritage, you know, and how, you know, immigrants on both sides, dirt poor, Irish on one side, Italian on the other, came over here with nothing literally dirt floor my grand my grand my mom's dad their floor was dirt up in indiana so so uh went to college went in the military made something of themselves and we're all doing great you know so uh i'm incredibly proud of my immigrant background and you know i don't you know it's not like it's not like my you know they were killing people you know but like you know you'd had like a uh, except for the guy in the street <laughs> All right. What's he was one, a deviant, man. What's one guy in a street between friends, right? Okay, He's fine. If you want to, you want to nitpick. You know, <laughs> I said, no, people, don't we make it a whole like fucking movie about it? You know, what are you? He was a pedophile, man. He, 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 she did a service. It was good. But you know, but they'd have like a, they'd have like a, um, you know, you'd have like a great co a cousin or whatever. Be like, hey, you need a coat, you know? <laughs> Go down his basement. And the other, you know, it's like that. But then, you know like literally like my chicago pure cellos like their father was a was a world-renowned plastic surgeon like like wrote a wrote a book on plastic surgery and and that that was uh used and my my father was a lawyer and another one of my aunt helen who uh who with louise uh my cousin louise um the two of them ran the trentino uh, uh restaurant in omaha and um when my sister and i would go visit they would um you know, she would, uh, Louise is great, man. She, she had a pink Cadillac that had 10 ashtrays <laughs> and, uh, and she would like bend down and she would open up the cash register and bend down and give my sit, like, look us right in the eyes, like come down to our level, my sister and I and give, give, uh, uh, you know, a silver dollar to each one of us and uh -huh. say, you know, I'll spend it all in one place. So lovely, 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 hardworking people, you know, my family. So you John, were you, um, your dad was in the service. Mm. Uh, I know he was he. I know he's deceased. Was was that was that due, during during the service or or? Yeah, yeah, he died he in was, Vietnam. Was, yeah, he died in Vietnam. He was a combat pilot uh, for no A1E's, uh, so you, search and rescue in in, uh, wow. in Vietnam. So were you were you so so were you a military brat? Like were you like all over the place? Like how did you get to Vermont? Well, until yeah, I was a military brat going all over the place until I was like four. And when oh, okay, yeah, out when I was a little kid. Yeah, he, um, they, uh, my mom moved the, uh, my sister and I to be near her parents in, uh, Falls Church, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So we lived there until I was 12. And then we moved up to Vermont when I was 12. John's mom's a speech and language pathologist. And that's kind of, I, I think that's kind of how right, you right. and I got to be friendly, John. I'll tell the story. Yeah. 
I was in a, uh, my first, when I moved to, I moved to Santa Monica, my first wife and I, and I somehow bullshitted my way into this um, position at this school that uh, it was like the, it's who's the, the filet of Santa Monica schools, who's who of the Hollywood power brokers are all there. And uh, I, I got this job and I'm like completely in over my fucking head, George. I don't know the first thing about behaviorism. I, I, I charm my way into this position. And in my classroom, like the first month of school, and it, it's just chaos, man. I got around these kids I'm working with. They're really needy. They're uh, socially, emotionally uh, disturbance, qualified for special ed through that, uh, that disability. And uh, it's chaos. And this guy just comes into my room one day and he's like, hey, what's up? I'm John. And uh, I want to I want to offer my uh, my craft to your kids. And starts telling me a story about how he can um what he does and this program he used to do in san francisco improv and whatnot and i'm like he's like, yeah, i'll come twice a week i'm like sure man i'm like so for an hour i got i'm going to get a fucking break for an hour so come all day long you, you got it man <laughs> so this guy comes in man and i don't know him from adam i'm just looking for a fucking respite situation i'm like i'm gonna have an, an hour to myself to catch my to catch my breath and this guy can do his thing but uh he comes in and he I, i've never seen anything like this john and i'm not blowing smoke up your ass when i say this and i, I tell everyone and everyone at franklin knows of course but uh, not a you have no background in special education other than your mom being a speech path and <laughs> just this guy is like a like a horse whisperer with these kids man he starts doing all this improv shit man these kids these kids can't sustain attention for two minutes three minutes any non-preferred activity if you can and he's just got these kids eating out of his hand and he just takes them through these theater exercises and a year of this and he, he writes a play with them he teaches them how to write a play he builds all the props with them does all the painting and stuff and uh, i'm getting into it I'm, I'm, uh, I'm involved and it, it's just so fun to watch him do this thing and it's all i, I use all that stuff today it's all in my toolbox all, all those uh like for ice breakers and stuff and my high school kids love that shit the, the ball thing the, the mm -hmm. all those theater exercises but it was just amazing to watch you uh do that shit man oh that's can you cool. speak to how well, that explain, explain that a little bit? What, so what are we talking about? The special ed kids a couple, I have a couple questions. So mm. what type of disabilities do they have that you're working with? Number two, the play that you're, or whatever it is that you're building towards an end game. Is that something you wrote or is that something pre-existing? No, he, he made it with the kids. You guys wrote the play together. So what disabilities do the kids have? Uh, social, emotional, uh, behavioral disturbance. Okay. Yeah, so, so what's your trick, Sarah? Yeah, John? So it was mostly mostly the uh, emotionally uh, challenged kids, right? Yeah. And, um, there may have been, you know, it's funny. I I don't um. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how it works, but it's sort of like I think just like in the world, I'm sort of looking to connect with people. I don't. I don't. Um, I'm really an introvert, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really like to leave the house. I'm not really, uh, I'm very, that's why the social media was like too much for me. Right. Uh, but deep down, you know, if I'm interacting with somebody, I want to sort of, um, you know, find a place where we, where we meet, you know, on the same level. And that, can, that tends, I don't know what that is, but it's not some sort of goal I set, or it just seems to be that way. I'm that way. And so, uh, I think that what happens with those kids is that I think that's why I often don't really I don't notice what their um, diagnosis is or whatever. Right. You yep. know? <laughs> like I think you know if, some, if a kid has Asperger's or something, you know I can see that, right? But I mean for a lot of the stuff, it's just kind of there's a kid in front of me, and and what's cool what's cool about that what's cool about like that scenario that you that you provided you know that the opportunity you provided for me was that it. it uh, there's such a sort of wide variety of, of people and also with sort of issues and it sort of allowed all of us to kind of do one thing together. Right. Like, like for all of us to kind of meet in the middle, right. At one. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure you remember like different things uh, sort of 
got different people going right like there's sort of different so you kind of throw the net wide initially and sort of do a bunch of you know the sort of most basic thing or whatever that might ever you know like you said the sound ball you're sort of throwing a ball and making a sound and whatever and imagining the ball and um and then little by little you know as as time goes on i i got to know those kids you know and i got to know where they were coming from and and you know who you know some of them would have sound and you know sound issues you know where they didn't you know so you'd sort of keep that in mind you know with uh you know or there would be things they didn't like to do or whatever you just got to know them and so that to me that's fascinating that's fascinating to sort of uh you know get have the have the sort of privilege right of uh of having people share themselves with you you know especially these yeah. kids that that uh you know i mean i think i i was a loner you know when i was a kid i wasn't a joiner and uh the world was kind of you know weird and scary and and I, and I sort of acted out a lot because i think that was my response to it was and so i was always in trouble as a kid and and frankly i didn't i didn't i I remember I, I, I always used, I always think I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Like, why am I always in trouble? You know, like, I'm not, <laughs> like, I'm not I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a bully. I'm not bullying anybody. I'm not, you know, like that kid over there, he's p punching that kid in the face. You know, I'm not doing any of that <laughs> stuff, but I was like fucking always in trouble. And so was that partially, do you think because you lost your dad so young? Well, yeah, I'm sure that that has a lot to do with it. I'm also, yeah. um, uh, ADHD, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, and then I was on, I was medicated for that. And, all the rest of that shit but anyways the point is so the, the sort of the outsiders and the and those those people i relate to them right like and so uh and i know back when i was young it really just only took like one guy you know or one woman or whatever that like saw you and like would see who you know see you as a person and yeah. uh and um and that was huge right so i was to me the opportunity to potentially be that person is uh you know you you pay it forward right it's like it, it's it's a gift to be able to maybe give that back you know? it's it, it was amazing to watch john that's, i'm not swinging from your nuts so it, you. I, I, that's what <laughs> i think i think i've I told I'm you this humbled. before in some vulnerable moments but i'm humbled that's uh, it's uh and john i mean you can't really tell us can you? he's a fucking monster the guy what you six four john you're you're big boy you're, you're like the most kids, you run the other way, but these kids, they, they <laughs> John, John's a, John's a large American. He, he'd have a hard time be, getting a hero because they couldn't find villains big enough for him. He'd have the, the John Wayne problem if he was a, he'd be the. That's such a, that's so kind of you, Nate. Thanks for that. Well, for everything you described about who you are and what, you know, how you, you're being an introvert how you grew up and so forth only suggests to me you know i i, I too i mean i joined the circus as well many years ago mm -hmm. and in you know what i call being in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. and you find a lot of i mean that's that's a place for somebody like are. yourself to go that's find right. yourself right. with equal like-minded misfits and outsiders yeah mm -hmm. and uh people and and the skill set of being an actor is you know it's 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 more about listening and engagement and and emotion and feeling it than than it is to you know necessarily just talk it through so i could see that being a real good skill set you know a, a real honest actor would it would have the ability to you know uh, reach people you know particularly somebody you know like the children that you were talking about it makes i call it mindfulness he told he's he's, he's it's mindfulness yeah. it's, it's yeah. all mindfulness just being it makes aware. a lot of sense it, it absolutely makes sense and it fucking translates to every realm of your of your life and like, th those kids are better learners afterwards for it you know if they can sustain attention imagine things put themselves in another person's position and it was just so incredible to watch it well i hope you. so because you know i mean that that whole school situation is so um it's still stacked against you, you know, like it's so like the individual is, is fucked yeah. in school. Right. And so the, the, you know, those teachers just have so much on their plate, you know, you guys like have, you know, you have, like you said, you have like 30 kids coming at you. And um, so they have no choice, but to kind of, you know, just sort of uh, plow forward and whoever is coming along is coming along. They don't really have the time to, and, and the system is not set up for them to have one-on-one -on -one you know relationships with uh with the kids and for those kids to get seen so so for if you're if you're a kind of put your head down and do the work you know person you do fine in school right but uh yeah. 
but a lot of people aren't like that. And so, and, and it's sort of too bad that that's whatever, that's the way it is, but it's sort of too bad that, that, um, you know, that, that, it's that it's like that for so many people and that uh it doesn't you know they might get you you wouldn't see like their potential right like you you might think they're they're not smart or they're not creative or they're not whatever because they don't they're not able to do these assignments in this order or whatever and so much sort of you know just wonderful uh wonderful stuff is 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 missed i think and lost in the always the case absolutely yeah. you you affected him man after a year i wish i wish you guys could have been there we put this play on at the end of the year like the, the, the of course it's the same day the superintendent is doing her walkthrough and there's all these important people on campus and they come in and they're in the npr and we start our show and these kids these kids are they're feral they're feral and that's oh, yeah. That's what they are. These are feral them. kids, man. They're wonderful. And but but these are kids that are in a different classroom because they weren't only a, a disruption to their learning; they're a disruption to other kids' learning. Like these are yeah. kids that have been, you know, it's kind of like Island of Misfit Toys over here. And they came in, and these kids are just—they got lines down. They got their routines down. Some of these kids aren't even literate. You know, they they they're they're, they're in fourth and fifth grade. They're barely literate just because they haven't been able to sustain attention. And they're fucking knocking this play out that they wrote themselves, performed themselves. It, it was just something to behold. You, a lot of hearts and minds that day, John. That's so, that's so much. It was awesome. Beautiful name. And we, and we did, we did it for a few more years. It was, uh, that was really cool. I don't know why they don't do more of that in, in the classrooms, you know, as art on a cart stuff. I, I think there should, uh, definitely be a more of a theater component in, uh, in, in classrooms with the mindfulness and all that stuff. Well, you were know. you was that disrupted uh, obviously to covid have you been able to are they uh, less open to having you know these more creative and outsiders oh it's locked down yeah they, yeah. They, yeah you'd you'd have a hard time getting uh, someone to, to and that's to and, and dude that's just another ancillary problem of you know closing down the school system like that like what what will it take to reestablish something that Nate, uh, as you describe it, is uh, beneficial to everyone involved. Well, so much of his curriculum, I don't know what you call it, John, whatever your bag of tricks is, is a lot of nonverbal communication. And it's be very difficult with the mass and stuff to pull off. Of. He'd figure it out, but <laughs> these are some of know, the challenges. Our, our neighbor, uh, the, the daughter has a camp and, um, and she said, oh, somehow improv came up or whatever. And she asked if I would this is during COVID. This is probably like a year ago or more. And uh, she said, would you come do improv with our camp? Our camp is online and we do our camp on Zoom. So these four squares that we see, like, like you know, there's like 30 yeah. <laughs> squares. And the kids are like from age like five to nine. And they're like out of their minds, bored. Like, you know, the idea of even trying to look around and see what everyone's doing. And some, someone's in the, in the background, like standing on his head. And this person over here, their parents in front of the camera, offering them a sandwich, you know, and the, five of them don't have their mics off. And, uh, you know, it's just like this chaos. And, uh, and that was what you talk about, like doing in your class, like th that was like a cakewalk. Like that actually, I, I could see, like, I, I didn't see any potential. We did stuff, but yeah. no, you know, it would like be like, I'd like to come in with like five things I wanted to do. And I would get halfway through one of them, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and sort of just lower, 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 lower the expectations and try to, and that, and that's, that's a really uh, exciting headspace for me to be in when there's like a challenge and when, because I, 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 I don't know what it is. It's competitive or something like I refuse to be beaten, you know, by the circumstances. And, uh, and I somehow deep inside, I know there's a way there's, there's a way there's just always a way. I think I'm, I think I'm, uh, I think I've, I've you're thought perseverant, John, you're perseverant. I, I'm a, I think I'm a, I think I'm a, uh, a, a, a cynical optimist. <laughs> what I am. I think I, I think I just think people are absolutely awful. Uh, but I'm incredibly optimistic and I keep, and I just keep going back in, just believing in, in people. And so 
it, I liked that. I like, and we did eventually figured out a way. Cause that's the other thing is that they would tune in and tune out. And then I just thought, Oh, if we could just go down line one, line two, line three, no, but it kept changing. And it, and apparently <laughs> it's different. Like my setup, you know, is, is I'm in the upper right-hand corner. I don't know how it looks to you. you yeah. Know? Uh, I, I figured that out on Zoom. Oh, I see. We might be looking at a different screen anyway, mm -hmm. but that, that challenge, that headspace of like, where I start with the premise, it can be done. You know, yeah. how are we going to do it? I, I love that. Machiavellian. <laughs> well, I think right, right now, I think we, we, we've hit about a half hour there. What? I know. I don't even have to go to the bathroom. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I got to get a beer. <laughs> so, you That's know, a great idea. There you go. So I think we're going to, uh, uh, do a little break here, John. I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, um, more about some of your uh, adventures on the stage and screen a little bit. Okay. And um, like to talk, uh, yeah, let's talk about the state of the uh, entertainment world a little bit when we come back. Hey, everybody. This is Eric from Slate River Farms. You may remember me from episode one, titled Farm to Toilet. I'm just dropping by to remind you to please follow $5 Buzz on Instagram. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and hit the subscription bell on YouTube. That way, you'll never miss an episode. The Buzzards have some great content locked and loaded for Season 3. I know I'm excited. Also, please check out Slate River Farms' website and our socials. We raise and sell certified grass-fed, grass-finished beef and pastured heritage breed pork on our fourth-generation family farm in upstate New York. Order online and we'll ship our goods directly to your doorstep via one-day shipping for all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and PA. From our pastures to your doorstep, life gets crazy. At SRF, we believe in peace, love, and pork chops. Hey, welcome back. Hope everyone, uh... wait, they didn't take a break. We did. All right. I was going to say, hope everyone's beards are fresh, but they're watching this in real time. This is why I'm the artist, Roger, not a host. <laughs> John, I got a little, I got, I got a little something for you, buddy. When oh, you were good. coming on the show, I, uh, I remembered uh, uh, so, something uh, clicked in my head. Something I was really proud of you. Um, mm -hmm. One day, it wasn't too long ago. Uh, I was still in Santa Monica, but I'm, I'm gonna read some names to you, John. I'm gonna read some okay. names and some films, and I want you to, I want, I want you to really listen to, 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 to the these individuals. I'm about to tell you, uh, Roger, if you would, I want you just, just keep an Oscar. I use your. Uh, Academy Rain Man skills there and keep a running tally of uh, the, 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 uh, the Oscars. Okay. Uh, Dustin Hoffman, American Buffalo. Yeah. Robert De Niro, We're No Angels. Rebecca Pigeon, Heist. Uh huh. Anthony Hopkins, Hannibal. Jean Renault, Ronan. Kevin Costner, Untouchables. Paul fucking Newman. The verdict. <laughs> John Piercello. What? Bill Spector. <laughs> now, now, now I want you to just keep, remember all that. <laughs> I remember John watching yeah. you in, um, in in Phil Spector. Um, J John uh, had had a big role in uh, in, in Phil Spector. It was this uh, movie David Mamet uh, wrote and directed. With Al Pacino and Helen Mirren. Oh, great fucking movie. And it's it was right up my alley, man. True crime and Phil Spector. Like mm -hmm. I, I could Phil Spector made wrote and produced one of the albums that could have been on my Desert Island Five. That just occurred to me. Wait, wait, uh, is it the Ramones? <laughs> no, uh, Death of a Ladies Man, Leonard Cohen's follow up, oh, New Skin. Wow. The Ramones one was end of the century, right? I, th I think so. The, yeah. With uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the wall of wall of noise. Yeah. Wall of sound, man. The Ronettes oh, and all that shit, dude. Oh, like that was a really odd pairing. Um, you got this uh, sophisticated, you know. We've already gone on the tangential uh, rails. We're in the weeds. Awesome. It Something. happens. It happens. I got the ADD, Roger. All yeah. Right, uh, forget about Phil Spector. Oh, wait, wait. What is this little like thing you're throwing out? All these people. That oh, I'm gonna get there, man. It takes okay. a moment. I, I like to take the long way. It's all right. Long way home, like Tom Waits, and um. So I'm watching John in this movie, Wait, and I'm so, I'm so proud of you. Super and, tramp. And I remember seeing like national commercials that you were in, and like that was really cool. And there's this guy that you know I, I get, get me buddies with. We have some fun outside of school and whatnot. And uh, I'm watching you in, in my in my apartment, 
in Santa Monica and I'm watching that film and I, I followed the, the, the case. Like I was obsessed with the Phil Spector case and uh, watching the movie and John has this great part. He plays this really like subdued detective, like this very, it's kind of like an Eagle Scout fucking straight arrow detective. And I'm watching this movie and it gets toward the end and, and uh, John's talking and he keeps talking and John ends the movie like john had the last word of a david mamet film he, he had david mamet's last words and that occurred to me right away i'm like holy shit i'm like he just got fucking mamet's last words shit like that is weird but it occurs to me for some reason so i'm like i want who else has gotten david mamet's last words all those people i just read john those are your peers buddy <laughs> all those individuals how many oscars we got there roger well, you said Dustin Hoffman to De Niro to Rebecca Pigeon none, Anthony Hopkins to uh, who else did you say? Paul Newman won. Yeah, good. I'm glad you didn't count the Lifetime Paul Achievement Paul Newman. one. Here, here's the thing. If Paul Newman's only got two Oscars, the Oscars are one. Bullshit. Exactly. Got one Thank Oscar. Thank you. He should have won got six. one Oscar. The Oscars are fucking bullshit because <laughs> there's never been a better actor than that guy. The, the reason I included Rebecca Pigeon is he, you know, uh, Mrs. Mamet, and she, so right. we got how many, how many, how many Oscars, and a wedding ring. All these people, David Mamet awesome. trusted with his last word, and those are your peers, John. I think I think Verdict was nominated for the screenplay. It was. No, no, no. It definitely was. It was nominated for, I think, five Oscars, Best Picture, Best Director, Actor, that, that, that's, Supporting that's Actor, and Screenplay. That's sort of, uh, that's one of, that's a movie that, um, how do I put it? Sort of like, uh, like, like Bicycle Thieves. Yeah. Uh-huh. Remember, remember <laughs> that uh, you guys framed a poster of Bicycle Thieves? Uh, framed and matted, John. I matted all my other. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're right. Framed and matted. Yeah. A uh, post. I still have that. That's yeah. a, a cherished. It's a cherished uh, belonging. So yeah, much I'm, like, I'm like that. So how are you comparing Bicycle Thieves to um, uh, the verdict? Because the 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 performance of those uh, actors of the of the main characters in those movies, uh, Newman and um, uh, oh my god, um, much. Oh, now I can't remember his name. Anyway, the 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 main the main guy in Bicycle Thieves that sort of the sort of visceral uh response i had to those performances that those performances sort of got inside me and moved me in a sort of core way that you know i'm i'm often entertained but like the sort of just the sort of i don't know angst that 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 those guys had uh i've never seen a performance better than than uh well, then those two performances, you know, but certainly it's uh, Lamberto Majorani. Majorani, God, thank you, Majorani. Um, is uh, thanks for looking that up. Um, yeah, I did. You know, the the uh, yeah, I've seen I, the movie many I, times. It's, it's stunning yeah. to me to think. Anyway, let's not even get into it. But no, I want to hear. John, let John, let me ask. Well, no, no, John, the, I'll get into it. The, okay, the to to me, it's um. My mother always said, start with something nice, you know, so uh, uh, so so the Oscars uh, that are coming up on Sunday, I will say I will give the Oscars credit a for uh, creating themselves right for 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 creating something and sustaining something like that, that stays in the collective conscience of at least our country and maybe even other countries as well. Uh, they they get my hats off goes to them for 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 making and sustaining something of of that uh, magnitude. It's a it's a weird for an actor. It's a weird thing to 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 talk about who's better than another yeah, one. Is such an course. odd like just as someone that does it. It's um, I always say that like you know to win an Oscar is kind, it's kind of like it's kind of like someone in the street walking up to you and saying hey good job in that but louder <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's really no different and and frankly uh the respect of my peers means more than to me than anything and and uh even more than the respect of you know my family <laughs> I mean as an artist like my like as an actor the respect yeah. of you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, Stephen Root, that I've worked with Stephen Root, who's like a hero of mine. Oh, yeah. And the fact that he enjoyed working with me and has told me so. And, you know, that just blows my mind. I mean, that's like a that's to me, that's 
easily, easily better than an Oscar. You know, the, yeah. the, the, like far and away. I would, if I had, I, there's two things that I'd give one away, I'd give the Oscar away and I wouldn't even blink an eye, uh, you know? And so um, it's just an odd thing, but it also brings attention to our thing. It brings attention to movies and it brings attention to, so it's, it's not, I, I'm not willing to say it's a negative thing because it's not, but it's just odd that, oh, here's the five best. Oh, and, and she's the best one. Right, know? right. And that's, I mean, that's been an argument for, you know, everybody from, you know, Brando and George C. Scott famously and, you know, uh, Dalton Trumbo, the writer. There's been a lot of people who throughout the years have poo-pooed the Oscars. I think recently Joaquin Phoenix is another one, you know, who kind of like, eh, I'm just doing this because they, they they want me to. Yeah, but to me, to me that's, that I, I, I wouldn't, I would hope that I wouldn't lack that gratitude. You know, I, I hope no. just like if somebody gives you a compliment, you say, thank you. Oh, yeah. like, like, uh, like Pesci, right. Remember Pesci's Oscar that, speech. That's all he said. Yeah. Thank you. Boom. Like, I love it. That's, nope. that, that's, that's the perfect Oscar speech. Have, have you seen um, a lot of the films up for the Oscars this year? No. I'm no. What, what, what are they? <laughs> I'll tell you if I've seen them. If I, I doubt but, it, because I I almost don't see new films. Well, so. the big ones, you know, like the the Power of the Dog versus uh, Coda. The no, but Co- I thought Coda's a show, isn't it? No, it's the movie. No, the motion picture Coda. It's about the deaf family. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was a show. That's on my list of things to watch. By the way, it's on Apple Plus. Yeah. Anyway, both are good. I, it, if if you haven't seen them, it's just not it's not really worth going down the rabbit hole. Of you know what I just wondered if uh do you are you I mean yeah, as a member of SAG do you um you get to vote on the Oscars? No, I get to vote on the SAG Awards. SAG Awards, that's right. Okay, and I have uh and I've been to the SAG Awards twice. These are all things that are these are all things that uh that just almost sound uh, unreal when I say them out loud. You know, the fact <laughs> I was, that... was going to ask you, John, what's what, it like when you 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 talked about the respect of your peers and. It's like one day you're, you know, up in Oakland or, or San Fran doing your thing. You, you told me like there, there've been some times you and I, I remember taking in a ball game with you once and in a vulnerable moment, you told me some of the, like the, the, the struggles of, of being a, a, an actor and, and how hard it is. Um, and I remember seeing you in fucking that film and I'm like, fucking boys arrive, man. He's getting directed by a man. What's it like when you're like, okay, is it, this was supposed to happen. Uh, David Mamet is, directing me like is there a part when you look yourself in the mirror and you're like this is it, this is happening i i've thought about this before and uh and i don't i don't have a really good answer for you but this is the best that i've come up with is that and i think that it um i think it actually relates to my reaction to COVID as well is that i think i've always sort of um you know maybe it, existed in, like like I, I haven't been like married to reality you know <laughs> so much uh peripheral for most most of my life you know it, as far back as i can remember you know my imagination you know was kind of king right and it kind of like i wouldn't let the truth get in the way right of a, of a good story but uh, <laughs> the, the um sure. so i think that yes i think there was a time before you know, definitely where I would get, I still get starstruck, you know, I still, I still, uh, do you really, I do, but it's more, it's more like, it's more like, Oh, wow. That person really, uh, like I don't get just because someone's famous doesn't grab me, but because somebody did something to move me. Of no, right. No, I understand that. I I get that. that, I'm, I'm very excited. Like uh, David Lynch said, um, any, anyone that creates is a friend of mine. And uh, and I, I subscribe to that. It, That's it's cool. sort of like when I meet somebody that has sort of uh, like <laughs> we were at the at the opening for Spectre. It's funny. We're going to talk about Spectre the whole time. But uh, which was what, 12 years ago or something. Uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but we were at the we were at the premiere, which is in a high rise in New York City or whatever. And it's to me, that was my first like Hollywood premiere. And there's like all these people there that didn't have anything to do with making the movie and i didn't know that that's the normal thing right that it's like oh it's an hbo thing and so 
HBO calls all these people and has them show up so that it's a big deal, right? Like, but that wouldn't even occur to me that that's what's going on. So I'm looking around going, what the fuck? Joy, Joy Behar is here and, and Regis Philbin and what, what, what you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, oh, oh, um, fucking Lou Reed. Lou Reed was there. No and, shit. And, 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 and um, why you know, I, then I would have been a little starstruck. You'd be starstruck, right? Okay, so not only was Lou Reed there, but uh, but Roger's I was getting selfies and shit. Jeffrey Jeffrey Tambor and I were, were were talking, and Jeffrey Tambor was another guy that was in the movie, a hero of mine. There, 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 this is another. Just the, 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 it never stops, Nate. It's like, the, you know, Larry Sanders show. Jeffrey Tambor was my fucking hero. So fucking in, great in that role, right? And now I'm working with him, and uh, and so. <laughs> He he and I were talking, and I said, oh, you know, we've been working together for three months or whatever. I said, oh, where's your wife? You've been talking about your wife, and I want to meet her now. Where is she? And he points across the room, and he goes, he goes, she's over, she's right there. And he points, and I look at the end of his finger, and Lou Reed is standing there. <laughs> his finger, and I go, no, nope, that's Lou Reed. And uh <laughs> <laughs> and 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 Tambor goes not him her over there <laughs> and so then I looked at Lou Reed and this is also funny I looked at Lou Reed and he was sort of confused like <laughs> you don't want somebody to feel like they're the butt of a joke right and yeah. so no, I explained to him, I said I said hi I'm sorry we're 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 I'm making a joke right now I'm John and he goes I'm Lou <laughs> <laughs> hey. That's and, awesome. I, and I would have said, of course you are, but I didn't have to. And uh, <laughs> and then Lou Reed disappeared off into the crowd, like 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 uh, fields of dreams in the corner. <laughs> he disappeared into the crowd, and he was dead like two weeks later or something. Wow. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that had to have been. I was just about yeah. to say that had to have been close to when he died. So when you said Lou Reed, I was a little. Sh but now it makes sense. Two weeks. It was later. like it was right. And then, uh, and then when they honk, 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 blink, 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 it's time for the movie to start. Everybody go. Everybody's left. And uh, Keith Richards. No shit. Keith well, there Richards. you go. Now you're getting Keith there. Richards now it's my turn to get. Now it's my turn for a selfie, Roger. There's all these tables with like drinks on them and stuff like that. And he comes out and he's, uh, you know, he really is. He's like a pirate. He's like, <laughs> yeah. like he's like deaf. And uh, and he goes uh, and he reaches over to grab someone's drink off of a table. Before, you know, he has to head in now and he's got to fucking load up. Right. So he's <laughs> heading in and he goes to, and his wife goes, no, no, Keith, no, no, Keith, no. And he like, he goes, hey. <laughs> so, like drinks the wine, the white wine that someone left on the table. And so my girlfriend and I always go whenever I'm going to do something bad. She goes, no, Keith, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool story. But to your to. To answer to like what you're saying, it's like, it's like a dream. The whole thing is like a dream. It's, 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 uh, and I don't think it's that far from what my kind of relationship with re it, it, it is a jump, but it's yeah. not a huge jump from what it was before. So as these things, oh, and now David Mamet's here. Oh, and now Barry Levinson's sitting there. Oh, and now <laughs> Helen Mirren. I'm in a car with Helen Mirren and we're being dragged around a parking lot. So as these things happen, it's sort of like, um, there's always there's always something human you know that happens in those interactions which reminds me that we're human beings on the planet doing stuff and that all of that other stuff that's not the real thing the real thing is that we're these two people you know like like with helen it was um the first the first day of shooting like we'd gone out to dinner the night before and watched rebecca do a gig and stuff to sort of you know, fucking Al's there and Levin's is there and like all Dave's there, like all these people are there uh, to sort of, all right, you guys, we're all going to be here. So let's just relax. You know? <laughs> That's I think yeah. what it was like. Uh, actually, we, we went to Al's house in, in, uh, in um, Beverly Hills poolside and read the script early oh, on, shit. you know, before. Yeah. So I'm sitting there at Al's house, like, uh, you know, so do you got to act cool? Like this is fucking normal or like, <laughs> well, uh, you know what? It's funny. I walk in and his daughter, I think Beverly D'Angelo's and his daughter is sitting there like drawing, you know, with pictures on the, on the table. Most normal thing in the world. There's a kid there in the living room, like drawing, like, so as I walk and it's, this is a house. I've been in houses before. Oh, and there's a pool down there. So yeah. in a way there's something incredibly normal about it. There's more normal about it than not. Yeah. Uh, 
I, know. I mean, I used to go drink at his dad's bar that he was, <laughs> it, which was in Covina, California. It was called Pacino's. <laughs> Al Pacino's dad had a bar? Yeah, called Pacino's in Covina, California. Now, the two of them, what? you know, they were estranged from each other for a uh. long time. So, but at the end of his dad's life, Pacino start, you know, would come around more and say, you know, before his dad died, they kind of tried to make amends at the end. But yeah, but you'd walk into the bar and it'd be, you know, fucking all kinds of photographs of his son all over the place. Yeah, but he, uh, yeah, he's an absolutely lovely guy. I, I've ran, I ran into him like a couple of times since we worked together and he always gives me a big hug and uh, he, he's, he's a talker. <laughs> he's a wonderful lovely guy that's cool and, uh, and, and um i i cannot imagine what it's like to try to do the work uh with all the stuff that he carries along with like i can't imagine like all this think of all the great stuff he's done since mm -hmm. godfather and really that the specter of godfather pardon the pun is is uh is never going to go away like you know like that's you know what I mean? Like Pete, Michael Corleone is it, culture. It's a cultural fabric. It's a cult. It, it, it's bigger than there's nothing bigger. Right. And so, no. so the idea that he carries that around with him and he how, now has to disappear into something and he has to do the work yeah. and people have to sort of see him as this new thing. Um, you know, and every little thing that he does is under a microscope, every little action he does and every little, you know, motion he makes or whatever. Oh, he's doing that thing again, where he does that again or whatever. So yeah. he's under a microscope. And the idea that he continues to be an artist, and, one, and, and I don't, I don't know if this is, um, you know, I don't know. This is just a theory. But I feel like uh, if I get too far away from the theater, I lose track of of acting. And I, I wonder if it's the same for Al. And I wonder. Yeah, if and he he, he came up, you know, unlike a lot of his brethren, he came up with the theater. Totally. You know, for, for all 100%. the pure. You know, he's Strasburg guy. Is he? Yeah, probably. He probably. You know, is. I think he. I think he is. Yeah, but you know, you know, with the guys like De Niro, not that much of a theater guy. He came uh -uh. To cinema from the, from the get go. You know, Nicholson Cinema. You know, not, mm -hmm. not a lot of those guys were theater guys. Both Pacino, amazing, both amazing actors. So. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree, obviously, but the, yeah. but Pacino definitely came from what was it the, what was the the big one that he did. It's not well, the did, Indian did, in the cupboard. Did you watch but that, was... that documentary about um, about John Cazal. Yeah, of course, the forty five minute doc. The, yeah. Amazing, and like that's that's how John got into uh, uh, Godfather, which would have been his first right. film. Well, was Godfather first, or was um, was uh... he's only been in five films, and all were nominated. Right, but I was trying to think of it was Deer Hunter. If it what what the first one was? It was Godfather, if... then Godfather, then the conversation. Godfather two, Dog Day afternoon, and then the Deer Hunter in there order. You go. Very Tony nice. John Rain. I got Rain Man. Strong word. I know you. you hey you Nate. God bless Nate, you. Nate, I got a cut. Speaking of Pacino, he played Ricky Roma in uh, the play. Uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was yeah. a mammoth film. And mm -hmm. um, Nate, if you if you'll entertain me for just a second, because I want to loop in a story uh, that includes you, and I think John may appreciate this. So over my shoulder, I got a picture of Val Kilmer, right? Big Val yeah. Kilmer fan who was in a mammoth film as well called Spartan. The Spartan, yeah, yeah. yeah. really good film. And uh, funnily enough, one about fifteen or twenty years ago, my sister. Uh, wanted to go to this uh, autograph meet and greet show in New Jersey. And we were living in Long Island. And I said, you know what? I'm not really into that. She's like, oh, well, Val Kilmer is going to be there. So I said, oh, fuck. All right. I'll go shake. I got the picture of me and Val Kilmer on the shelf. So <laughs> I remember that was on Facebook. <laughs> right. So it's like uh -huh. you're standing in line and you could meet Val Kilmer or you can meet uh, Henry Winkler. Right. So you're standing <laughs> there in line. Talk about the There's other some like professional wrestlers there and like. Some uh, like guitar play. It was a very random mix of people, but you got Val Kilmer and Henry Winkler. So I'm standing there and and Winkler comes up. He's like, hey, man, are you waiting for Henry or are you waiting for Val? And I felt bad. I'm like, hey, dude, I'm waiting for Val. So fast forward a couple of years. Nate, Henry Winkler said that to you? Yeah. He's like, dude, are you waiting for Henry or are you waiting? I, I like a <laughs> schmuck. I'm like, dude, I got to decide between Iceman or fucking uh, Arthur Fonzarelli himself. So <laughs> Iceman fast forward, man. Yeah. Dude, so fast forward a couple of years, Nate. I'm out in Santa Monica. 
meeting up with you and Pete. And the next day we got to breakfast. My wife wants to go to some place in uh, Brentwood that she wanted to go and have breakfast. So my little daughter Brighton's in there. She's like two years old running around. Who walks in the front door is, is Henry Winkler. (laughs) he picks up my daughter he's like hey here's your little girl but i'm bringing it uh back with mammoth and winkler because john uh the show that you've uh worked on on hbo uh winkler hasn't he had a pretty uh big role on uh the show mary with with, with, uh hater as well yeah mary what's it like for a guy like that you know you talk about iconic actors like al pacino but you know in a different way winkler was you know i mean Bigger that's a trend yeah and look Bigger he's than all of them and he's still out there working yeah. on his craft and there's still work for these folks to I, do I don't, you, you come back right i don't have i don't really have the words to uh uh to explain that thing that you're talking about because to me arthur fonzarelli was absolutely my hero right and, <laughs> and i remember davin charlton down the street uh, his parents had enough money to get him a Fonzie jacket from Kmart. Uh, <laughs> I I could not afford. A Damn it! You didn't get one. I, I didn't get one. I didn't get a six. Million how how old are you, John? How old am I? I'm yeah, in well, my fifties. Well, me too. I was just wondering because we're probably about the same. So if all that shit was about we're the same time. To- yeah exactly that's i don't have a problem saying how old i am but yeah it's all right well you're not trying to get jobs you know from uh (laughs) nate were those the days where they were selling ip on everything from services to you know posters oh yeah anything that was nailed down they were were my mom's funny enough it was phenomenal and so henry winkler was just this sort of idol yeah yeah my world and so to then be in a table read over at Sony, and by the way, right. to just be on the Sony lot, which was MGM, which in 1939, uh, what, what what was being filmed in 1939 at the same Wizard time? Wizard of Oz. No, and, oh, as Gone with the Wind. Yep, that's right. There you go. That's right. It was my people. I love it. Uh, and so to be on that hallowed ground, to be walking around, I I I remember one day being there, like like going, holy shit, like those people were walking around on this lot you know, yeah. that I'm standing on right now. It was absolutely not lost on me. But one day after a table read, we're heading back to the um, garage to get our cars and Henry and I, and uh, and I'm telling him, uh, whatever, a boring story about how <laughs> awful my Barry audition was. Like my first audition was so fucking bad that I had to ask to leave the room and go take a walk and come back in and just get through it. And I got done with the audition and I was calling my girlfriend saying I fucking quit acting it sucks this isn't like right I can't take this anymore <laughs> of course you got the role <laughs> and then I, got, I got a call back and then I got the role what well, between getting the call back and doing the call back I've never prepared I, I knew I literally knew the scene backwards I could do it backwards you could tell me a line and I could tell you the next line and the line before I never have prepared more for that and so and then never have I let go of all that as much as I did in the it, do, doing the callback was like stand like doing stand up. It was uh it was totally me and the and you know and Bill and Bill Hader <laughs> and Alec Berg and uh yeah. and Amy Solomon, you know, producer on it. So it was yep. them sitting there and um Bill fell out of his chair. He literally fell out of his chair on the ground at one point. He was laughing so hard. And um and so anyway I told him the story about how awful the initial audition went and how depressing it was and and henry stopped he's like stopped he's he's smaller than me and he stopped and he turned around and sat on one hip like he's the fonts like just like, just like the fonts <laughs> would no shit on one hip and he looked at me and he goes well you know it's the doubt that makes you an artist <laughs> and i was like oh my god he, he like he's like a prophet like like, <laughs> like he arrived in my like so that maybe kind of speaks to that whole thing about like, um, you know, like, oh my God, being starstruck or how do you be around these people or whatever. Well, shit like that happens. Like once, once, uh, you know, there was sort of a, 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 a moment in my career where I stopped thinking of the audition process as um, me asking for something. And I started thinking of it as me and the casting director trying to put together something cool that 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 could show the production what we're capable of right there it is 
And yeah. so, right. so That's once right. I made that shift of like, I'm not asking for anything more anymore. I'm, I'm giving you something, you know, right. and we're going to, and we're going to collaborate and give you something cool. Everything. Got, it's not like all of my worries got away and, you know, whatever I was on easy street, but, but that was a huge shift. It's amazing so, how that can be seen too. Like that can be that that whole affect can be seen. <laughs> I'm telling you, I watched, I watched, uh, I watched, I saw a YouTube video of uh, Tom Hanks auditioning for Splash, and I don't know if this is going to translate or not. But like, like he w- he was doing the audition, and then he got about partway through, and he goes, "Oh, hey, could, let's let's go back to let's go back to the to the uh, second page on this one. I want to do that part again." And I I was going looking at thing. Oh wow, like. Like he'd done bosom buddies at that point, right? Like, yeah. like he he did not have the right <laughs> <you know? laughs> in my in my adolescent mind at that point to be like, what? Ask, where does this go, swagger? Yeah, to tell them to go back to do where it. does this fucking confidence come from? Exactly. Like, like who is he telling them to do anything? And uh, but of course, now looking back on it, he considered it his time and his audition and he was going to make the best of it yeah and he was not doing that out of any sort of arrogance or anything he was doing that because he was trying to put forth his best effort and 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 provide the best tape for the people and so that really that changed my life and also uh watching um watching uh benicio del toro do one where he had like a he had a script in his hand and he would like look down and he goes what I told you, you know, and then he would like, boom, be right there. And then he would look back down at the script again. But the, so those two things sort of reminded me, oh yeah, it's really about the engaged moment. It's not about me having practiced some, you know, show for you, you know, to, to, to uh, entertain you or whatever. It's not me being off book and trying right. to showing you what you would get if you hired me or something close to it anyway. And, and it's not even just that beyond that like mm-hmm. what you're talking about there they you might not even be hired for that you might right. not get that but everybody in that room is going to remember you for the next one that, that that is an excellent excellent point that is how i got on twin peaks i got on twin peaks uh, uh, uh long story short I, I went up there to calvert to the studio and it's a weird you know the, it, it's it's weird it's sort of you go in and uh lynch is not there they have a camera and and joanna and uh Krista Hazar, who, who's, uh, oh. who's, a, who's a dear friend of mine. <laughs> us. Okay. And, uh, the two of them are sitting there uh, on either side of the camera and they um, are like, pretend like, you know, the cameras lynch and, uh, and do the thing. Anyway, the point is when I got done, I, I had no idea how I had gotten there. I didn't know how they found me, like what my agents didn't know. I was at ICM at that point, And they were like, I was like, how, how am I getting called in for this? Like, well, we don't know, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and um, so we certainly weren't doing our job, uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, so I get out and Krista comes out and she goes, John, she's just, just a uniquely wonderful person. And um, I know now, cause I'm now friends with her, but uh, she came out and she said, um, John, that was great. And I said, what am I doing here? And she goes, oh, well, don't you remember two years ago, I was, I was a, an assistant on, a, on a, um, an independent film. It never got made, but you were a bus driver and you said, welcome to Los Angeles. And you did your little hand like this. And she goes, remember? And I said, no, I don't remember. <laughs> and she said, oh, well, I did. You know, so really? to, to your point, that's exactly right. So two years later, I'm in eight episodes of the new Twin Peaks because Krista Hazar remembered me do this as a bus driver you know and uh you know it's just it's 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 crazy you just be don't memorable know. is the lesson no i don't i guess i don't i mean <laughs> to me it was just i literally don't remember the audition but apparently it was i did something that she remembered so i was reading this uh real, real quick going back i'm just to, to follow up on that uh going back to the godfather as we mm-hmm. were talking about pacino Robert De Niro auditioned for Michael Corleone. Yeah. He slays it. And Sonny. And, and Sonny, that's right. And, and, and slays it. And they were going to give him the role of Polly. Coppola worked out a deal to get him off because Pacino was supposed to do uh, bang the drum slowly mm. and play the, oh, wow. the part. Yeah. And so they made it work it out. So, you know, Pacino goes, goes over here, insert De Niro over there. And there was also trade with another movie called The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight. 
Mm-hmm. But there was an ulterior motive. Had this movie ever gone or made, De Niro had an idea in his, I mean, excuse me, uh, Coppola had an idea in his head. And certainly that idea was, you know, not only was he going to save him for something else, potentially, but he saved him to play fucking Don Vito Corleone, you know, and, and that was the first time and one of only two times in history that two actors won an Oscar playing the same character. The other two was Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix for playing the Joker. But but this was in the same movie universe and it kickstarted Robert De Niro's career along with Mean Streets and around that same time. Can so you, can you imagine? I mean, you can't imagine anybody else in that role, you know, yeah, that's true. I'm sure De Niro would have slayed it, too. But, you know, but Pacino and I rewatched it just the other day. That's the reason why it's funny. It's all in my head. So I showed it to a bunch of kids because I do a lot of I'll, I'll do a lot of little film theory, little film history with the with the uh, uh, young 20 nothings and give them, a, you know, perspective of the film and watching Pacino again, as we just talked about and, and how everybody else is, you know, trying to do their best to out Brando Brando on some level. But Chino is that stage actor. He's internalizing it all. It's well, like, and, that. and I think we've read, we've all read, and it's going to be cool when the when the offer comes out. You yeah, know? I want to can't, can't wait to see but, it. But um, I mean, all of us aficionados, you know, like yeah. that are obsessed with the Godfather. But but he he um he talks about about uh, or Coppola did talked about how the dailies were coming back, and Pacino <laughs> wasn't doing anything, you know, because in his mind, because he's a fucking actor, in his mind there was an arc to that character, and you had to see him go from you know, the, the war hero, whatever, quiet guy to the Godfather, right? You have to see him. Yeah, at the that's end, right. You know, and so in, so all the stuff they were doing, he was, you know, anticipating this arc and was sort of, you know, do, doing what needed to be done in that scene. And they're going, what the fuck is he doing? You know, right? Okay. there was a studio that was having concerns. <laughs> the, the they said, like, why is, what is he doing? I know where you're going with this, but go ahead. I want you to finish it. No, no, but that's exactly right. Where, and, and and I'm sure that it's. Uh, but what saved him was they shot the scene where he shoots Salazzo and McCluck, uh, you know, the Sterling Hayden and uh, Al Lethieri. So w- that was the scene they went back and they go, OK, we could go now. We could keep continue can on. And is there a better scene in any movie anywhere than that? Like they told him, don't sit down again. Come out of there. Dude, blasting. Drop the gu- blasting. He fucking doesn't drop the gun right nope. away. He sits down. No. He only shoots. And he only shoots. And he only shoots a lot. So once he was told yeah. twice in the head. Yeah. So to shoot him twice. It's, uh, <laughs> to, to, to kind of your point, I was reading this uh, uh, autobiography by uh, Chris Kennedy, Lawford, Peter Lawford's son, one of the Kennedy cousins. Okay. And uh, he's writing, he, he read for this part in a Oliver Stone picture. Didn't get the part, but he got this beautiful letter, like sent to him, thanking him for the for for going to the fucking wow. whatever. That's and he's like trying to make sense of it to his cousin Maria, and he's like, "What the fuck is this?" Of course, she was with Arnold at the time, who was the king of Hollywood, and she explained to him, "It's like the Hollywood landscape changes so fast, mm-hmm. and you never know who is gonna be. You're you're down one minute, you you could be the fucking A list. Like, like that's a courtesy given to you, Chris, because." tomorrow you could be fucking Tom Cruise. Like that's, that's just how the quickly the, the landscape changes. And there's all this courtesy that, that is practiced because uh, today's, uh, you know, yes. fireman number three through the door is going to be tomorrow's fucking. I, I will tell you when I was, I was at, uh, I think the last time that I was at the SAG Awards, um, uh, uh, J- um, Jason Bateman, uh, I think won for Ozark. Right. And uh, yeah. And yep. he, he got up there and and what's really cool about the SAG Awards is that it's all of us, right? Yeah. You're there with, with your people and there's no, and it's, it's glitzy and stuff like that, but it's still a bunch of actors, you know, and which is cool as fuck. And Jason gets up there at the podium and he said, he goes, you know what? Don't, don't give up. You're always just one job away. Just remember that. And he would know, right? Like, you know, before Arrested Development, right? Like, you know, what was it, Teen Wolf? Two Valerie. I mean, <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So so the fact that it, it just, it was so, I found that there were a bunch of moments like that where it was sort of uh, um, encouraging and sort of to heartwarming to be with your people saying, come on, come on, we can do it. We can do it, you know? 
But, um, well, I think it's uh, it's about time we're going to wrap up here. And um, John, I want to thank you very much for coming on board and regaling us with all of your, uh, you know, sort of uh, inside baseball, you know, and on the craft itself, and and also just some of the things that happened not only in your career but others' careers. And well, you want, you want, you want one one quick uh, Helen Mirren story? Fuck yeah, I do. Okay, one quick Helen Mirren story. So so uh, there's a bunch of them, but um, this one <laughs> is we're 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 heading into the to the courthouse inspector. And uh, I somehow, you know, I, I, I we did the scene, but then Dave wanted all of these like extra bits to happen. He gave me a bunch of ID cards and stuff. And so there's all this business all of a sudden. So I got my head got fucked up. And about midway through the scene, I was like looking over and I, I was so out of it that I was like, oh, shit, that's Helen Mirren. You know, like that's how fucking far out of it I got. And uh, and Oscar winner H Helen Mirren. So we get back to one. We get back to our starting point again. And I'm sitting there and I don't know what prompted me to do this but i turned to her and i said i don't know what's going on but i'm just totally inside my head right now i gotta just i gotta just jump you know i gotta just jump and she's got she's like a little pixie like a little fairy she goes yeah yeah jump jump and uh it was magical it was like that's that's why she's the fucking greatest right she's, like, she's encouraging you just she's go. encouraged me she's like do it do it jump 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 so oh I, my I'm god telling, if you ever wonder what Helen Mirren's like, she's like that. She's That's like, awesome. I always wanted to hang out with Helen Mirren, man. Never got to yet. So well, and she's incredibly attractive. I don't have to tell you. I, no, I I, I get that. But, and, but, uh, ever since I saw her, you know, the first time I vividly remember seeing her in a movie, of course, is 1981 when I saw Excalibur on the big screen. Okay. So playing Morgana. Yeah. I so I say the, the cook, the thief, the wife and her love. No, no, no. That's much later. And I'm a big fan then. And I'm a yeah. huge Peter Greenaway fanatic. And yeah. Love that movie to death. Oh, good. Yeah. I love the. That's in my top 12 favorite films of all time. <laughs> oh, that's great. It's about time to watch that again. Oh, God. I love that movie so much. Love Greenaway. Anyway, again, uh, I just just want to say thank you. It was great to meet you. And hopefully, I'm a producer. Maybe we'll work together someday. That would be wonderful. Maybe if we'll if do nothing something. else, it'd be great to have a beer with you. And and, and that's you. even more important. Uh, you, uh, San Francisco Giants fan. Right Wait, I was gonna, I'm going to lay it out. Yeah, and I'm also a Giants fanatic. Oh so, wow! Yes, and 49ers and the Giants. So. Oh my goodness! I I, I was uh, my, for my birthday this last uh, on the 12th. It was Game Six. My girlfriend and her son took me to Dodger Stadium and we got fucking stomped, as you remember. And it yes, was I do. And I was like, it can't end like this. And I immediately got on the Internet and I got bleacher tickets in uh, at, at Pac Bell and I got on an airplane and I went up there uh, the next day or two days later and watched Game 7. Watch us get beat again. But, <laughs> but, at least, but at least it didn't end like that. It didn't end. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. But I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's a finer uh, sporting venue in – the United States, at least, and that uh, Back where the Giants play is yeah. incredible. I that's that a great, that's a great ballpark. I was, I was the standing there yeah. with my child, so you can tell how long ago it's in, 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 in a in a baby Bjorn, you know, like <laughs> no, 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 that was at that was at Candlestick. So we we were walking a toddler. I was standing with older with a toddler, and I went, oh, we're out, we're out by the cove, right? We're out in the you know in right field, and we're. Uh, and I look and I go, oh, Barry Bonds is up. We should stop and watch because he was on oh, his yeah. home run run. Mm -hmm. he, was on his, yeah. he was on his 73. He was on that run. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we stopped, sure enough, number 55, right over oh, our head. Damn. Yeah, I saw well, I, wait, Real quick, when they were uh, uh, against the Angels mm. during the World Series, I got to watch him hit a home run in game two uh, right over my head in a, game, a losing game. But okay. I got to watch, you know, Barry hit one right out of the park, right over. You know that, that was I, again. I, I agree. I, I know what you're talking about. It's it it, beautiful. It's a beautiful time to. I did a commercial quick, with Barry Bonds. Oh, you we did a commercial with him. Yeah, and Jason Alexander. Yeah, up in San Francisco. Crazy. What was the uh, product? I think some like Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. Because the, <laughs> the, the the conceit was that um, he was hitting nuggets chicken nuggets out into the into the stands and uh and i was a janitor like cleaning up and i had to dive out of the way and then and then they decided that um barry bonds doesn't hit foul balls and so so he wouldn't be hitting them into the stands he'd be hitting them out and so then i was cut out of the commercial wow. and 
furthermore, it was uh, I don't want to besmirch Barry too much, but uh, all the things you've heard about them seem. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, I got Nate. I I can't leave without saying this, and I know we got to go. But again, my daughters. We were at a hotel in Beverly Hills. Another time, I was out in L.A., Nate, and I was probably hanging out with you. And uh, my daughters are running around. They're outside, and you guys might know the hotel, but there's like this small pond out side and um there's a gentleman dressed sitting by himself uh wearing like a road biking outfit like spandex outfit and my daughters are like jumping around like looking at the koi fish and i'm like dude that's barry bonds right there. And they're like talking to him they're striking up a conversation with the guy i'm like come on guys leave mr bonds alone he's like no it's cool uh, i got two kids or i have kids it's really and he was like the politest most oh, good. gentlemanly person you could ever want to meet and you know growing up on the east coast like uh barry bonds was always seen as a villain so i had yeah. this image in my head like he was going to be a dick and rude and for some reason i had this picture on my phone because my buddy was a baseball card collector and i had a picture of him and bobby Benia, very slender probably weighing like a buck 75 when they played for the so i was like i'm like do you remember these days and he's like yeah man i do it's like the nicest fucking guy <laughs> was such a polite guy like I'm, talking I'm to my glad kids to hear it. and i'm yeah. glad to hear he was nice to your kids so my my daughter brighton is running around with barry bonds and uh henry winkler and uh nate she's gonna be a terror i don't know <laughs> <laughs> what, what's coming next for that kid you know well let's say our goodbyes gentlemen and i want george you to take us out since i brought us in i got one more uh aside here <laughs> i can't I just gotta say it one more time john how's it the Beatles song the, the love you take is equal to the love you make or however they go John I, good things happen to good people man and the love you showed those kids man that few people have patience for and it wasn't just my class this guy was omnipresent he not just a good member of the community he was, he's a great dad and he was Thank always you. there I, we went to science camp one week I, I, I miss you John we, we, had, we had some good times Thank but you, you were, so you were really were, uh, you were, uh, you were a presence on that campus and, uh, I am certain you were missed. That means, that so means the world I hope you're, uh, I hope you're still awesome. doing that. I still, I hope you're still giving it yourself and, uh, Thank no matter you. how big you get and how many mammoth, uh, I want you to get the staccato gum chewing mammoth speak, man. I, I you, you played the, you played the, 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 the straight lace detective and I, I didn't see your play, but you played a priest. So I don't imagine you got to say fuck too much. And, uh, that's what I want. I want you to get that role. Then, then. We well, gotta, you, know, you gotta do that. Speak. This is this. <laughs> this Chicago this, hard this ass this. fucking. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the uh, it, it, it when you worked with Mamet, of course, just just read the lines. <laughs> no, I got to. He wrote a a pilot that didn't go that his daughter directed. Um, and we had, uh, I mean, Grace Abriski and Rob Riggins and stuff. It was great. Oh yeah. Uh, it was awesome. And uh, but in that there was a phone call, right? So I got a Mamet phone call. And I was absolutely word perfect on all the half words and all the ellipses and all the stuff that I had. It, and, that, and then, uh, yes, I, I understand. That you, no, of course I will. All of that stuff was fucking word perfect. It might be the proudest I am of anything that I've ever done, that I did a little mammoth speech on the, on the uh, telephone. Oh, I love it. And got it. It's got awesome. It word perfect. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, uh, John, we really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming. We, we'd love to talk to you again soon. Nate? Yeah, any, any time. You guys are a pleasure. That's just been a lot of fun. A lot of different. We covered a lot of territory. That's we did? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, thank sir. You. And Nate, uh, thank you for uh, sitting in for Pete. Uh, you know, you'll be back again soon. You'll be behind the uh, creative process of this one. And uh, Roger, uh, it's been great. And for Pete? Uh, this is George signing off. Uh, if you get a chance, follow us on Instagram, uh, you know, subscribe to us on YouTube, subscribe to $5 buzz anywhere where you get your podcast. We look forward to, uh, seeing everybody again. If you got any questions or comments, uh, it's $5 buzz, all one word at gmail.com. And, uh, we'll be looking forward, uh, to the next opportunity. So, uh, thanks again, guys. Appreciate it and have a great night. John can plug us on social media. Oh, wait. no, we're fucked. <laughs>